Okay. Donc, euh, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue à cette 50e édition euh, du Meetup TDS. Euh, je m'appelle Victor. Je suis, euh, je suis très ravi d'animer cette euh, ouverture de, de cette présentation. Et donc, euh, nous sommes très ravis d'accueillir euh, Ralph Gomers comme speaker aujourd'hui, qui va nous parler sur euh, euh, l'interopérabilité entre les euh, librairies euh, de manipulation, les matrices et tensors. Et, euh, surtout pourquoi il n'existait pas, pour certaines raisons, un seul API et sur, surtout un, un effort qui a été entrepris depuis 2020 pour proposer un tel standard, donc dans l'écosystème de Python. Ralph est très connu et impliqué dans, dans, dans la communauté de PyData et il est large contributeur et mainteneur de NumPy et SumPy, euh, SciPy, pardon. Également, donc, il fait partie de la communauté de gestion de ces projets. Et euh, au quotidien, donc, il est directeur, euh, un des directeurs de Consight Labs, euh, donc, euh, qui a pour but de soutenir euh, les projets open source. Euh, les projets open source, surtout, qui font la fondation euh, pour euh, la science de données. Voilà. Donc, la présentation sera en anglaise, il, sera, euh, il est enregistré. Et puis, donc, même si Ralph, bon, il sait comprendre le français, il comprend le français, mais il pourra peut-être. <rire> il va présenter en anglais. Euh, donc, ensuite, c'est donc, euh, le dernier meetup pour cette saison 2020-2021. On espère que ce sera le dernier en remote. Et on sera très ravis de retrouver notre communauté en présentiel, comme c'était avant Covid. Ce serait vraiment chouette. Euh, donc, qui sommes-nous Nous sommes donc l'association et le Meetup Toulouse Data Science. Nous aimons data, de la data. Euh, nous proposons quatre, quatre types d'événements. Euh, les data talks, et, bon, en distanciel euh, depuis un an, euh, comme celui-ci. Donc, c'est plutôt le style conférence. Donc, euh, pendant une heure, donc, on a une présentation euh, par un speaker, et puis à la fin, on a les, euh, une petite session des, des questions. Et euh, quand c'était un présentiel, euh, effectivement, on pouvait, euh, après avoir une discussion informelle autour d'un impératif, impératif. Ensuite, donc, nous avons les, euh, les data non blabla qui ressemblent plutôt à les travaux dirigés. Donc, c'est un événement euh, de 2-3 heures où les participants peuvent apprendre une nouvelle technologie, faire des exercices. D'habitude, on les fait plutôt dans les week-ends, pendant les week-ends. Euh, les événements comme Data Journal Club, c'est une petite réunion informelle euh, d'une heure euh, pour discuter d'un papier ou d'un sujet ou d'une technologie. Et le dernier, le plus intéressant, c'est donc euh, Data Morito. On se retrouve tous autour d'un verre de Morito et on peut parler de, des sujets qui nous intéressent. Euh, ensuite, donc, euh, qui sommes-nous euh, au niveau de l'organisation Nous sommes six membres qui organise le Meetup, donc la présidente Samia, le trésorier Florian, Aurélie, moi, moi-même, François et Thibault. Donc, n'hésitez pas, donc, contactez-nous pour échanger sur des sujets qui vous intéressent à la fin de cette présentation ou par d'autres moyens de communication que je vais vous présenter tout de suite. Nous avons un site web avec cette URL, donc http wwwtlse data data science. Nous avons plusieurs rubriques qui sont plus ou moins à jour par rapport aux événements qu'on qu organise, puis donc les sponsors, l'équipe. Nous avons une rubrique pour, donc si quelqu'un voudrait proposer un sujet abordé et surtout présenter ce sujet-là pendant pendant des meet-up TDS, donc vous pouvez remplir une fiche sur GitHub et puis euh, nous allons vous contacter et on, nous allons trouver un moyen de présenter ce sujet sur euh, data science ou euh, intelligence artificielle. Un, un autre table assez importante, donc c'est les moyens de communication. Donc nous avons un, un profil sur euh, le plateforme meet-up, nous avons un Twitter et le Slack. Donc euh, l'invitation, je pense, vous pouvez le trouver via ce site internet. Et du, du coup, donc vous pouvez nous contacter via ces moyens-là. Le Slack, surtout, qui marche plus ou moins bien. Euh, concernant le prochain événement, 
Euh, donc, euh, normalement, ça serait le data morito, mais selon le, les conditions euh, pandémiques, donc nous allons vous confirmer la date, soit juillet, soit plutôt septembre, plutôt 2020, 2021. Donc, euh, voilà. Donc, nous allons vous informer par rapport à cela. Euh, nous avons également donc six sponsors. Euh, donc nous, nous les remercions pour leur soutien même pendant ce, 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 ce période difficile. Donc Texter, Actuia, Coworking Arico, Airbus, euh, Liber, Ori. Merci à eux. Ensuite, quelques activités avant de passer à la présentation. Donc euh, euh, il, y a, il y a un mois, donc, nous avons fait un sondage de la communauté pour euh, prendre votre, votre retour et vos, vos opinions par rapport à aux événements comme on les organise par rapport donc à, aux événements qu'on organise etc. donc merci beaucoup déjà à ceux qui ont répondu à, cette, à ce sondage donc et ceux qui n'ont pas répondu vous pouvez trouver ce lien là via cette présentation qui sera mise en, mise en, mise en place euh, après la présentation ou sur le Slack vous pouvez également trouver ce lien là donc si vous n'avez pas encore rempli ce sondage merci, merci de, de votre retour par rapport à notre activité euh, une autre actualité, donc Actuia, donc, euh, le magazine est euh, numéro 4 et un kiosque. Et encore quelques news que je voudrais présenter, du coup, c'est plutôt euh, euh, que j'ai choisi pour euh, cette présentation-là, que j'ai trouvé à, à peu près bon, assez intéressant en fait, pour partager aujourd'hui. Donc, une autre euh, success story, ou une histoire euh, de succès par Google sur euh, l'utilisation de machine learning pour rendre le monde un peu plus accessible aux personnes handicapées. Donc, comme là, c'est un cas de dans le développement d'une prothèse avec l'IA dedans qui permet de, à cette personne-là qui est fan de batterie, jouer de la batterie à, à haut niveau qu'il a. Qu a. Euh, voilà. Un, une, autre, un autre, un, une autre news que je trouvais intéressante, donc ça, c'est côté Facebook et A. Donc, euh, donc là, c'est le contexte, c'est euh, une réalité augmentée où ils font euh, donc la translation, euh, traduction, pardon, traduction, donc... Euh, quasiment simultané sur l'image, donc, et donc l'algorithme IA qui permet donc à prendre le style de la, de, du texte et euh, donc incruster la traduction avec le même style euh, que, que l'image initiale. Voilà, une autre, une autre news que je trouvais également intéressante, c'était sur la fabrication des processeurs, donc dans cet article de Nature, là où Apparemment, il parle donc d'un algorithme Deep Reform Smart Learning qui permet de réduire drastiquement la, la conception des, des processeurs, qui euh, actuellement donc, prend quelques mois pour les ingénieurs et bon, pour les humains et euh, quelques jours pour l'IA. Après, bon, la qualité, c'est à discuter, à voir hein, vraiment, mais après, bon, il lance aussi une, euh, une annonce en dis disant que ce type d'algorithme a été aurait été utilisé pour la conception des, des PPU version 5, donc c'est les accélérateurs de calcul, donc infrastructure Google proposée par Google sur leur cloud. Voilà, et donc là, bon, je vais terminer donc toute cette partie présentative et laisser la parole à, à Ralph Gomers et passer en anglais. Uh, so, uh, thanks again, Ralph, for joining us with the this presentation we're really excited to have you here and to learn about this uh, pi data api and so please take it away awesome well, thanks for the introduction uh, victor and thanks for the invites um, let's see if this is going to work yeah it works and now even all right so hopefully that's looking good So I'd like to talk to you today about whoop, how to play not good. All right, let's try that again. I've had this problem before. Yeah, it can happen on Mac. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> let's see if that works without how to play. <laughs> I don't have to talk really fast. Right. Um, All right, so we're going to talk about n-dimensional arrays or tensors. Some some people like to call them tensors nowadays. Uh, so this is a, an initiative that um, I started um, with a few other people like last year, um, really to 
tackle like the fragmentation between all of the array and tensor libraries. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'm at Quantsat Lab, so so me and a few colleagues have been coordinating this effort, but it's been uh, like a very broad effort. So we have sponsorship from from Microsoft, Intel, Google, uh, LG Electronics, and, and DE Shaw, as well as from Quantsat, our employer. Um, so that that gave us the bandwidth to kind of try to design this problem in the in the right way. So let me start with a question. Um, maybe something to think about. Actually, this is easier in real life when you can stick up your hand. Um, but maybe think about like if you write code like against like a, a NumPy or a PyTorch or something. Like how often do you use like really novel concepts? Uh, and say you want to switch, like you know, you probably started with NumPy like a long time ago, and maybe you want to switch to TensorFlow or to PyTorch. Like, how often do you do that? Because it has completely different capabilities. And how often is it just because, well, it's faster or like, you know, it has a particular deep learning functionality that you need? All right. I think it's mostly the latter. And when you do that, you'll find that everything, like the concepts you already knew, like, uh, and dimensional arrays and indexing and broadcasting and type promotion and like the, you know even the spelling of functions is all slightly different really for no good reason mostly right and this is this, there's a lot of friction there so yeah we tr we're trying to address that friction and it may be useful to kind of take a take a step back for a few seconds and, and go back in history so because we have a very long history of, of array-based computing in Python. So Python itself is from like 1991 or so, right? And then very shortly after, someone invented numeric, um, which kind of already looked like NumPy does today. Um, and then eight years later, some astrophysicists were unhappy and they wanted something to be faster with small arrays. So they, they forked numeric and made numarray. And then very quickly, like luckily, people figure out that that's a bad idea. So uh, like Travis Oliphant wrote NumPy to kind of you know, undo that fork. And then for about 10 years, like very little happened. Like we had Tiano, which is, had some very interesting ideas about uh, auto differentiation and then the deep learning focused. And we had Numba for performance, but really, you know, everyone was mostly just using NumPy. And then, like in the last few years, we have this explosion of libraries, right? There's Dask, there's uh, TensorFlow came next, and then PyTorch, Kupai, uh, and MaxNet, as well as some that already disappeared, uh, like uh, CMTK from Microsoft. So, and they're, they're all different. And people are designing like the next generation libraries as well. Like, NVIDIA, for example, has this very interesting Legate library, which is uh, scalable, like massively parallel. Uh, and all of these things need an API. And so it's, it's, it would be nice if they worked together a little. And today, they really don't. So here's a picture of kind of all of these libraries and uh, the kind of the stack on top of them. Right. So starting, starting in the middle, you have NumPy and then people use, you know, the most popular libraries like SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Image, Mapcodelib, and those all really work just with NumPy, right? There's some like little bits and pieces, maybe Scikit-Image, a few functions work with Dask, but that, that's about it. And then, you know, PyTorch and TensorFlow are kind of generating their own ecosystem, like FastAI, uh, BoatTorch, Pyro for PyTorch, and Keras, and you know, this, this stack keeps on growing but it's all in, in silos. So the goal of the, you know, the effort that I'm talking about today is how to bring that back together. And at what point you know, do we stop duplicating everything? Because it makes sense at a low level, right? If you, if you write a CUDA library, like you probably can't use much of what's in SciPy. But if you just want to make pictures with Matplotlib, you know, why doesn't Matplotlib accept TensorFlow tensors? So here's a concrete example that's actually being discussed right now. 
and that has a bit of momentum because Psychic Image has a has a grant from the Jan Zuckerberg Institute to kind of work on this. And what Psychic Image wants is, you know, image processing algorithms to not only work with NumPy arrays, but work with CuPy arrays as well. So it can run on the GPU and work with Dask and maybe even CuPy arrays within Dask so that you can have distributed arrays and you can have distributed arrays on a GPU. And if that works, then probably JAX is going to work as well because it has a very similar API. And two years ago, like NumPy introduced a dispatching mechanism that some of you may have heard of. So I'll just mention the name, but I won't talk about it otherwise. It's called array, dunder array underscore function. Right? So it's one of these special methods that kind of, you know, do magic things with your, with your inputs and you kind of, you can, for example, you can take a, a Dask array, you can feed it into NumPy, and this Dunder array function will be recognized, and that means NumPy is going to call Dask in turn again. Uh, so that that kind of worked fine, but the problem was that, uh, well, first it was hard to introduce because of backwards compatibility, but also the NumPy API wasn't really very well defined. Like it's really large, about 700 functions even in just the domain namespace. And then you count all the other namespaces, it's more like over a thousand probably. And it, keep, it keeps on growing. And then some of the, the way some of the functions worked, uh, that didn't actually work well on a GPU, for example. Uh, so it needed some redesign. Um, so, I also found an example of a package that actually managed to do this. They, you know, the package is called INOPS. Uh, it's actually pretty popular in deep learning. And really it deals with uh, kind of all sorts of reshaping operations. And it can use like named axes and it's pretty nice. So it's like it has one function and that does like uh, reshaping, it does concatenating, it does stacking. Uh, so you can, it's very flexible and it supports NumPy, support PyTorch, support Keras, uh, et cetera. So I dug into this package because it's only a few functions. So it's kind of easy to explore the whole thing. And what it has, it has, you know, the, the public functions that it has that you're gonna, that you actually want to use in your code. They're about 700 lines of code. And then to make that work with, uh, with all the underlying array and tensor libraries, it needed almost as much code, so 550 lines in this case. And then if you look at the code, it looks like it's sketched here on the right. And so it has some abstract backend, which is the thing that the public APIs are going to use under the hood. And then for a function like transpose, um, it's gonna, for NumPy, it's gonna call transpose, and for PyTorch, it's gonna call permute. And for Keras, it's gonna call permute dimensions. And these things all have different names, but at least they still behave the same. So it's not that hard. So if you, if you look further in this backend thing, it, it just gets worse and worse. And you know, that, that kind of very quickly like, indicates that there's a problem here. Because if you want to do this for a larger package, then you have to write almost as much code for your backends as for the functionality you're actually interested in. It's going to be, you know, everything takes twice as long. By the way, if there's any questions, like feel free to interrupt me. That's uh, supposed to be an informal talk, so uh, it's easier than sitting on your question for half an hour. If anyone right. wants to, uh, there is a reaction button where you can uh, raise hand or. Oh, yeah, and um, just just feel free or in the chat, and I'll, we'll make sure with Victor that you get the question. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. Yeah, it's hard for me to actually see the chat, but feel free to yeah. interrupt me. Um, all right, so I actually want to switch to Visual Studio Code and just look at at a few uh, other examples, uh, which I think I have to stop sharing and share my other window. Zoom. 
Well, we have a question. Uh, oh, go ahead, Victor. Sure. No, I was just yeah, saying the same thing. Like Francois was asking about how come that we do not have much more uh, line of codes for backend part? Actually, Francois, you can unmute you and ask this question if you like. Yeah, um, the question is uh, pretty simple. Since we have many, many backends, um, how come in the uh, example you showed, uh, we see that, for example, you have one for TensorFlow, one for NumPy, one for uh, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. In the end, you have, it seems to me that you would require a much, much line of code for all the backend parts, right? Because it gets, you multiply it by the number of backends, because basically, if you're lucky, you just have to call the right function. But in the end, you have to call the right function for each backend. Yes, but not all the code is duplicated, right? So the first thing has this abstract backend. Yeah. Right? So that's what you're going to call. And, and many of the functions are, are going to be the same. Like uh, A range, I guess, you know, is something that everything has. So you don't have to duplicate code for that. Right? So the, the backend is just going to work. So and the other backends will just kind of overwrite, you know, if, if they're named differently or they behave diff differently, like they're going to overwrite the abstract backend. Okay. But I, I guess you're right. Like this is still fairly simple functionality, right? It's just manipulating an array and doing like reshapes and stuff. So it's like there is not much happening there that's complicated. If you would if you would try to write more complicated algorithms and, and use things maybe like convolutions or something, like the the balance might be even worse. All right, um, so I just created a test file here and I actually had another purpose for writing this code. I wanted to investigate um, a, a technical topic about like how views and copies work. So we'll get back to that in a, in a bit. But basically what it does is it imports all of these libraries and getting them all to install into the same yeah, virtual environment isn't our story. That's also not easy. Um, but since I'm on a MacBook, like Kupai is not going to work because that's GPU only. Uh, but everything else works. And then let me jump to the functions that I actually wanted to write. So they're they're extremely simple, and they're basically like a, a set of test cases for doing in-place operations. Right, so it's create an an array of of ones with with a shape of three two. And then yeah, add a, add two to it, and then do an in-place subtract of, of one. And then I just want to uh, extract the first element. And it shows already the problem because these functions like get first element. Normally you would just index with zero comma zero, right? But that that didn't work in the case because that in this case because it didn't work for all libraries. So if you jump to the definition you'll see that um, Dask needed to be special cased because it needs to you know, have the dot compute at the end. Otherwise, you know, you get some abstract object, you don't get the actual number. And then for a maxnet, you had to special case it because it was the only one that returned an array instead of a scalar. And then there's all the other libraries. And then for, for ones, it was the same. I wanted integers because they print nicer. And so MXNet here had the special case because it doesn't even, it doesn't have its own D types. Uh, and that was, that was actually pretty surprising to me, but it, it kind of steals NumPy's D types, um, which means if you just write module dot, you know, in 32, like it's not gonna exist in MXNet. And so all these very basic functions that you, you know, probably use every day, like ones and reshape and A range, like they have special cases. Usually like TensorFlow has quite a few as well here. Uh, so TensorFlow and MXNet are the most different, but really no two are the same. So and then I wrote a few more of these, um, like reshaping and in-place add, uh, do some slicing. 
And I have 12 of these functions. I won't, I won't go through all of them, uh, but there's, to understand the output, I'll show this one. So there's an indexing one um, where you take an, an index, which typically is a number, uh, or it might be a, you know, an array of Booleans, and then you know, a, a second axis. And there we had to do a try except because apparently like this simple syntax is something that not all these libraries understand. Uh, so if you see a minus nine in the output at the end, that's like, yeah, this library doesn't support this syntax. So, and then the rest of the script is just run it with all of these libraries, um, put the result in a pandas data frame and then print the data frame. So we can just run that. It's a second or two. All right, it made me the zoom demo effect a little bit longer. All right, so it prints that I don't have a GPU, um, which I already knew. And then, so I printed here the summary of what the um, what the type, what the function does, and then. I just subtract the, the, every result from the NumPy result. So if it's zero, it means it, does, it gets the same as NumPy. So in this case, actually PyTorch is the same as NumPy. It kind of deviates in, in more complex cases. And Maxlet is mostly the same. It only has one case where it's like a little different. And then you see like this second group of functions, task, TensorFlow, and JAX that are really very different, as well as then support some operations. So it looks like everyone is a little different, but there are two classes, like Dask, TensorFlow, and Jax are alike, and NumPy, PyTorch, and MXNet are alike. And to read the underlying reason really is that the, the first three have a mutable data storage, and the second one doesn't. So in all, in all libraries, you can do x plus equals one, um, but in the first three, that will actually modify X. In the second three, that will make a copy on copy under the hood and give you a new array back. So X itself, like the actual data and memory, isn't modified. Well, we have we have more complex examples, but I think this this kind of shows the problem. Like this is about as simple a code as you can write, and like it's really complicated to make it work on multiple libraries. Um, I have a question. So, uh, can you also mention why, uh, like, uh, there are, like, why there is an advantage to, uh, maybe, uh, having mutable uh, operations or, um, like, why why there is a difference between the two groups? Oh, that's a that's a very philosophical question. Um, so I think. Implementing a mutable data structure is easier um, if you want to make it performance, right? So, if you have, if you look at Dask, TensorFlow, and JAX, they all have to have basically a you know build up an internal graph of all operations. And in TensorFlow one, you had to do this you know yeah. by hand, basically, which you know the people who remember that you know found it pretty painful typically. Yeah, yeah. graph still exists. Right. And the reason is like this X plus equals one, it kind of makes a copy, but often like you can you can optimize that out later if you know the whole computation graph. And if you're in like NumPy, like you see one statement and you execute it, and then you see the next statement and you execute that. Right. If you would make copies then, like you know, you start copying, you know, and using more memory and, and taking a lot of computation time like really quickly. Uh, for things that are, you know, even just assigning a single element, right, that should be, you know, less than a microsecond. But if it's a really large array and you have to go copy the whole array, then it can be a really expensive operation. I see, I see. Yeah, so basically, uh, dynamic graphs versus static graphs uh, for PyTorch versus TensorFlow and uh, NumPy obviously doesn't have any. Uh, so, yeah, that answers. Thanks. Exactly.
Hold on, sorry, let's jump back to the slides. Oh. Maybe my email is not the most interesting. Um, yep. So this compatibility is really cool. So my brilliant idea was let's create a standard, um, which, you know, <laughs> The, the amount of people, yeah, I know someone was thinking this, right? Like you, <laughs> probably at least half of you were thinking XKCD comic. Uh, and standards are re in general, really painful to develop. And the problem is if you don't make sure that everybody adopts it, you just make things worse rather than better. Um, so of course you have to like think really hard, like how do you do this in a way that we actually make the situation better? And what the, the approach we took is kind of start a new consortium where we basically have like, at the moment we started, like lay out the goals and make sure we have buy-in from each of those libraries uh, and have some companies that sponsor it so we can do it fast enough that like, you know, the libraries aren't gonna change before we're done building something. Uh, as well as you know enough community members that you know this is gonna um, this is gonna fly with the community basically because people don't like when you design something like you know in a room with a few people and uh, like it's all completely done and you say like oh, here's the end result like you know please take it or leave it right so that that process of how you get buy-in from the beginning was very important for us um so we were lucky that there was actually a lot of interest in solving this problem so we had like three maintainers from numpy um a couple from from tensorflow uh, and basically every library was represented by at least one person and that gave us some confidence that, that we could actually make this work and the second thing was that we that we made sure not to try and do too much um so the, what, what, what gets problematic, like what, when it gets problematic is when you start making choices that constrain what people can do, right? So nobody minds if you say like, hey, you know, this functionality has to have this name as long as they can, you know, there might be some backwards compatibility constraints, but you know, if that's really bad, you just choose a new name. But if you specify some behavior that for some reason, like, doesn't work with the way TensorFlow happens to be implemented or you know with the with the way Dask handles its dynamic graph at, at that point you know that you're gonna get serious pushback right? and you know because people like performance they like their own libraries and if they have to do something that decreases performance or you know that doesn't work at all like they're just gonna say no uh, so a big part of the effort was figuring out like what are all the constraints you know given all these types of you know libraries that we have and even like you have to take care of libraries having like PyTorch has a JIT compiler internally right so you can't do anything that is hard for that JIT, JIT compiler um, so this has been a very uh, educational exercise for me uh, so so we created this organization and this, these are the goals we had for the first year. Uh, so first think about like, how do we actually standardize this? And you know, we have to have a methodology and also build tooling because in the end, we can't just like, you know, make decisions based on what we think is right. We have to collect a lot of data because for each library, we have to know exactly like each function that is there, each keyword, like, and where they differ from each other. Uh, so a lot of the effort we spent in the beginning was um, developing like introspection tooling so we can scrape all these APIs, you know, we can run tests against them and, and make sure which one's aligned and which doesn't. Um, and then the second one was to start working on a, a draft document that was complete enough that you could actually understand it uh, and, and have a productive discussion on the, you know, the goals for, for the standard. Um, but not complete enough that it was all set in stone because we were sure we're going to forget a bunch of things. And, you know, if you go to a, to a library maintainer, like they always have good ideas. And even, you know, even if it was already perfect, they still want to change something. That's just how open source works. 
uh, or maybe have software engineers work, I don't know. Um, and then the second part, I haven't talked, I'm not gonna talk about it today um, because I'm talking about arrays only, we're a little further ahead with that. Um, but we try to do in parallel kind of the same for data frames. And that's a slightly harder problem uh, because data frames are just in general a little less mature and people are less happy with the, the concepts and the APIs. They're also a lot younger, right? Like numeric, the first array library is 25 years old by now. Uh, Pandas was only written in 2009, I believe. So, you know, it's 10 years instead of 25. It still seems like a long time, but there's a lot of design iterations you can do in the next 15 years. Um, so, and then we, we kind of published it, had a, you know, have a public review period. And then by the time like, that we get a few libraries implement this and, and you know, while doing that, you find a lot of the flaws it's like in the details of the design. Um, try and finalize a standard for 2021. Uh, so we have a website, data-apis.org, as well as the, the public repos on github.com slash data APIs. Uh, so there's some blog posts and, and things like that. So if you, if you want to look at it more, uh, that's where you want to go. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what the array API looks like. Um, so what we try to do is specify the syntax and the semantics. So the syntax is basically the function signature, right? What's the names of, of the function itself and of each of the, uh, the positional and keyword arguments. And then the semantics is what does it do? Like in the end, what numerical results is it gonna give back? Like the, you know, the array, shapes, et cetera, like, and what, what math does it implement? Uh, we try not to say like how, you know, what the precision of the results should be, because that's really hard to do. Like it's gonna change even within a library if you, if you move between platforms. Um, then the second one is like the fundamentals of the, of the array object itself, things like casting rules and broadcasting and indexing, as well as everything that the Python language specifies. And the third one is uh, data. I call it data interchange. It's basically like if I have like a NumPy array and a TensorFlow tensor, right? you can't feed a NumPy array into a TensorFlow function, but you should know how to convert one into the other. Right? And then the functions in the library only have to know about their own array object. And the hard part we had to figure out there was device support. Uh, because that didn't exist in the Python language at all. Like Python has a protocol for this data interchange called the buffer protocol, but it doesn't know about devices. Right? So if you have a library like, like JAX that you know, can have tensors that live on CPU or on GPU or even on a TPU, and you can send them to NumPy, but like it, it doesn't know what to do with it. Right? And if you, if you send it like, hey, you know, here's my data, here's a pointer to where it lives, and the pointer is a GPU pointer, but in the end, it's just an address. And so if you don't have a way to communicate about what device it lives on, you know, you're just gonna read some arbitrary piece of memory and crash probably. Um, so that was an interesting new line challenge. And then the most important thing we tried not to do was execution semantics. So we wanna say like, you know, how do you spell this function? What's the result to expect back? but it doesn't say anything about how you compute the result, right? So if you want to do it, you know, in pure Python, really slow, perfectly fine. If you want to do it, par you know, in parallel with all the cores that you have, right? You want to do lazy evaluation, you know, you want to do some elaborate task scheduling with some graph, like it, that's all perfectly fine. It should all be possible. So the only thing we try to do is make sure not to specify anything that makes any of these things impossible. But other than that, we try not to say anything about it. And then there's a bunch of uh, topics like master array or IO that's, that's really specific and, and felt like that we didn't need to specify. All right, so let's look at a little bit of code. Uh, so 
On the left here, there's an example for a softmax function. Right, so this is something that pretty much every library has, and it's relatively uh, easy, so it's a, it's a good example. Um, so this softmax function x, we now want to work on any kind of array or tensor that says it's compatible with the API standard. So to do that, the first thing we do is we have a helper function that says get array API. So it checks like, is this x, does it say it's compatible, right? And there's a special way that it can declare that it's compatible by some, you know, dunder method. And if it is, you extract the namespace. So XP on purpose looks like NP, but a little different, right? So it's the, you know, import numpy as NP, but then different. Um, so we know that if it is compatible with the array API standard, it will have all the functions in the standard and it will have, like, we know it has the same behavior. So then we can just start using these functions. So we call here the exponential function, uh, then the sum function, and then we return, you know, the exponential divided by, you know, that, that partition sum. And this is then a softmax function that you have to write once, and it's going to work with all seven or however many libraries there will be in the future. And the same should work for more complicated arrays, as long as they're written in Python, right? It's like if there's, if there's calls here to custom C code or something, that's another story. But as long as you're, you're writing it in Python, uh, which is the, you know, a large majority of the, the higher level code, uh, then this should all work. And the second part of the slide is about the data interchange. There really is only one function for it. Uh, there's this project called DLPack. Um, I think it originally stands for Deep Learning Pack, but it, it really isn't deep learning specific. It really is just like the Python buffer protocol, except it is device aware. Um, so we had to do some changes to it to improve it because people wanted uh, stream support on CUDA. Um, so that if you have one library that uses, say, the default CUDA stream, and another library that uses a custom stream, like they, they need to know from each other, like there needs to be some way to synchronize those streams, uh, or at least without doing an explicit synchronize because that's expensive, um, but that you can reliably transfer data from one to the other and basically without copying code, right? So it shares memory in a way that is, that is safe. Here, I'll go to the next one. So this whole API, what, what does it look like? Um, we try to keep it as small as possible. So to only get the, like, really what we think about is the, is the core of an array library. So there's one array object. Uh, it only has six attributes. Like the standard ones like NDM, shape, size, D type. Um, and has a few thunder methods because in the end you have to support all the Python operators. Right, including the exotic ones like uh, bit shifting and modulo and things like that. And then it has things that are specific to the array API. So the, there's a version number for the API. So it can say like, hey, I'm compatible with the 2021 version. Um, just to, you know, when you think ahead and like, you know, people are gonna want to add things in the future. We try really hard not to specify anything that needs to be changed. So backwards compatibility, like stability should be really good. Uh, but for sure, the next version is going to have more functions. And then there's this array, Dunder array namespace attribute. And that's the thing that's being checked for in this get array API function that I, that was in the softmax example on the last slide. Uh, so if a library adds this, that's basically declaring like, hey, I'm, I'm familiar. I'm compatible with your API. Uh, then there's some, some D type, um, but only literal. So if you have a module like XP, you know, you have to have XP.pool and XP.float32. Uh, NumPy has many more ways of specifying D types, and we left all of them out. 
Um, then there's a one device object, with a couple of constants, and then on the order of 125 functions um, in, in some of these classes, like array creation and manipulation. Um, so there's things like a range and ones, uh, all the element wise math and the logic functions like logical and logical or that you often use with Booleans. Uh, statistics functions, that's really like the basic ones like mean, standard deviation, uh, variance, things like that. Linear algebra, that was actually the hardest one by some distance to because some of the linear algebra functions are getting really complex. Uh, so we actually, since I wrote this slide, we have just changed it so that there's only a few linear algebra functions that everyone has to have, like matrix multiply. Um, the more complex ones that are typically like solved iteratively, like a SVD decomposition or QR decomposition, uh, they're kind of optional. So you can, if you have one, you, ha you should have them all, but you can leave them. You can choose to leave them out. And then a whole bunch of utilities, like a unique sort, uh, those type of things. And so that API is all documented in uh, just a, a Sphinx stock. Uh, that can be found here, and there is an API. There's an API section, but the most interesting part to look at is probably the first section where it tells you the purpose and scope and the use cases that we kept in mind when designing. Um, so it really gives examples that you know that are problematic today or that should work. Uh, like the NumPy authors, for example, came to us and said, like, hey, you know, we tried to support NumPy. But NumPy has all this behavior that is really hard for a compiler like NumPy to support. Um, so we added these examples and make sure that like with this API, it will actually be easier to do than NumPy. Uh, and then there's some, some assumptions, uh, which is, in my opinion is, is very important to always uh, think about and, and document. And, and those are things like, hey, you know, what? What about dependencies? What do we assume about the hardware that is running on there? Things like that. All right, so I want to dive into a more, you know, some more examples with what were the hardest things to design for. And I'll start with the, the hardest one, uh, which is why I had that demo at the beginning. Uh, that is mutability and the copies and views. All right, so this example where you, on the right we say you know x is just a, an array of four values of one and then you take a slice of that uh, so y is the you know size two and then you modify it right this example is going to be different and the reason is this copies versus views and the views are really I'm not, I don't think they were invented by NumPy, but I, I guess popularized at least. Um, and so the views like NumPy, QPy, PyTorch, and MXNet were the four libraries that, that have them. Um, but on the other hand, they're, they're really problematic for libraries that are based on, on the immutable data structures or on delayed evaluation. So, so they don't have any of this view. So if you change Y in this example, right, the question is, does it or does it not change X? And for TensorFlow, JAX, and Dask, it does not. And so that's a pretty fundamental, like if we want everything to behave the same, but at this fundamental level, like it doesn't, uh, what do we do? Right, so there's parts of the syntax that we decided to, uh, that, we, that is so common that we have to support so these are the in-place operators, like plus equals, right? If that doesn't work, like, you know, nobody, <laughs> at least NumPy and PyTorch and CuPy are not gonna care, right? That would be just be too, too restrictive. And the same with item and slice assignment. So this, this second line, like Y equals X, you know, and then, you know, colon two, that's actually something that 
didn't work or maybe still doesn't work in Jax. And, oh, sorry, I, I said that wrong. So this works, but if you would change the equals by plus equals, so we'll make it a slice assignment and say like, hey, I have an array here and I, I want to change the first row of it. That wasn't supported by all these libraries. And we said like, you know, you can add this with your, you know, with your computation graph. It's just going to not be in place while the syntax looks like it's in place. Um, but you have to support it. Uh, on the other hand, the most important thing that we left out is this out equals keyword. So you know that pretty much all NumPy and PyTorch functions have an out equals keyword, right? And then basically, instead of the function creating a new array and giving that back as the result of the function call, right, they, they kind of fill the result of the function call into this out equals keyword. Um, that, that's actually it's a, a little bit of an anti-pattern and it's only you know, the only reason like NumPy you know, invented it was because it was more efficient to write certain algorithms because it didn't have a compiler or a more efficient way of doing it. But if you look at actual code, if you look at like SciPy or scikit-learn, it isn't used that much and the code to support it is really complex. Um, and given that like, this would be too difficult for TensorFlow, Jackson to ask, um, we decided to leave that out. So then for one and two, we, we have this one problem left. Like we have these operators, but they're not gonna behave the same. Uh, if you have a view and you mix it with in-place operators. So that's the one place where we say like, hey, here we don't specify any, anything, but we, we say like, hey, this can result in two results, uh, depending on which library you use. So just be aware that, you know, if you use in-place operators and you mix them with uh, with views, like you may get implementation specific behavior and then it will just not be 100% portable. Right. The second part is D type casting rules. Um, so there's an easy part and there's a hard part. Uh, the easy part is when you have casting rules for different D types that are uh, of the same type, right? So casting rules is like, you know, you, you have an operation that say, um, add a comma B and a has type, you know, D type one, let's say, you know, U int eight and B has like another D type uh, in 32, right? What's, what's the D type of the output going to be? That's what you want to know. And that, that's what these rules have to say. And if you're only dealing with integers or you're only dealing with, you know, two floating points, uh, D types, that's fairly easy because typically it just ends up being the biggest one. And in some cases, if you do like UN32 plus N32, you might end up with N64. Uh, but really that logic is fairly straightforward. And where it gets harder, if you mix integers and floats. And so the, um, the example given here uh, is like x uh, is just a, an a range of length five. So that will be integers. Uh, it might be in 32 or in 64, depending on the library. And then I create a second array with float 32. And then I multiply them. And then I want to know what the output type is. And it turns out that this, this is handled very inconsistently between, between libraries. So NumPy will give float 64 for this example. Uh, PyTorch will give float 32. And TensorFlow will just raise an exception because it doesn't support any of this mixed D type operation. So this is an, uh, the second example where we had to say like, you know, we can, we can give you a set of rules, but this, if you mix integers and floats, that's the one case where you will get implementation dependent behavior. And the, th the third part that was, that was tricky was 
data dependent output shape or d-type. And here's a few examples on the right that I can kind of cover get rid of my zoom window. So this first line where it says x2 equals x and then index it with an x larger than three. Right, this x larger than three, that will give you a Boolean array. Right, so if x is zero to 10, right, it will, for zero, one, two, three, that will be false. And for the rest, it will be true. So in the end, you will get like seven true values. So x2 will have size seven in that second dimension. Um, this is, this is problematic, right? If you have the result of some function call or some operation like indexing, where you can't predict based on the input shape what the output shape will be, right? Because it doesn't depend on the size of X, it depends on the values of X, right? They have to be larger than three. And this means that you cannot know what the shape of X2 is before you've actually run the code because probably x, you know, maybe it was created, you know, in some artificial example, but more likely it came from actual data, like image data or, you know, whatever you're trying to work with. So in general, this, this is really hard to do. And especially for the, you know, the TensorFlow, JAX and Dask, it's hard because remember they have this computation graph. So they want to build up the whole graph before, you know, running any compute. So if you don't know what shape something is going to be, or you, know, you don't know what size it should be. So if you want to pre-allocate the output uh, or do some kind of like compiler optimization to, you know, that, that runs over the whole graph, like you can't do any of that uh, if you don't know what, what shape or, or what D-type it's going to be. Um, so there's some tricks around that, but in general, it's pretty challenging. So we have to avoid this as much as possible. And luckily, there are not that many functions uh, that, for which that, that is the case. So the only two that are really, really popular and that we felt like we had to include are unique and non-zero. Right? So unique finds the unique values, um, which clearly, if there's duplicates, like the result type, the result output is going to be of a smaller shape. And non-zero the same. And it only gives you back the non-zero elements. So it's also the, the output shape is also going to depend on the input values. Uh, so these ones are included, but they come with a big disclaimer um, that says, like, hey, you know, this may this may run slow or not be supported by the, the library, even though. You know, it says it's compliant with this whole array API standard. And the last one, this is where we made a slightly more rigorous decision, is value-based casting. Right? So this example, this last example, where X is you know, a flow 32 array. And then if I add one to it, it remains a flow 32. And if I add a bigger value to it, it turns into a flow 64. And this is the part that the, that the number apps were complaining about, uh, because they kind of do the same thing, right? They they have like they basically generate a bunch of code, send it to LLVM, and they need to know what types they need to generate. Um, so if they don't know beforehand if this value is going to be one or ten thousand, they really don't know what to generate. So here is that like this is code that. NumPy does for historical reasons, but really nobody likes it. Like, and if we could go back in time, we would have made this design decision. So let's just say like we don't, we forbid this, which of course is gonna be a little problem for NumPy uh, if they wanna uh, adopt this standard. So this is one of the reasons why in the NumPy implementation, uh, that I'm going to talk about in a bit because it's like it's close to ready. Um, but there, the there's a separate namespace for the array API. So if you if you look at the behavior of this x plus ten thousand in 
DRA API module that it's going to get, it's going to give float 32 back. While in the main name space, like for backwards compatibility reasons, it's still going to give the float 64 back. And we, we may later have a separate effort to see, you know, how bad it would be to actually change this behavior in NumPy, but the, you know, the expectation is that that's, that's going to be a little painful. It's going to break some people's code. And in general, NumPy is a very conservative project. We don't like to break anybody's code. Right, I think this was the last like major design problem. So if anyone, this may be a little complex. If anyone had a question about that, please shoot. So for NumPy, probably it will be like version two can adopt this pattern. Ooh, yeah. So NumPy version 2.0 is a very like, <laughs> it's been debated for like almost 10 years because a long time ago, like NumPy development now is fairly nice compared to how it was 10 years ago. Uh, like there, there were lots of like fairly unpleasant <laughs> discussions about people wanting different things. And each time there was such a topic, uh, people said, yeah, it's like, oh, you can't change this because it's going to break people's code, right? Or, you know, worse than break, like if you break with a loud error, sometimes it's fine. But if you all of a sudden just get different results, that can be very bad because how are you going to detect this, right? Like most, especially back then, like most people were just individual scientists, you know, doing their thing in their lab and they would dig up code two years later and run it again on four versions newer. And they would just expect it to give the same result. So usually the answer was like, oh, if this is so bad, why don't we just make it NumPy 2.0? Right? Which, which really doesn't solve the problem because users don't look at version numbers, right? They just type pip install NumPy and like they still expect it to work. So NumPy 2.0 got such a bad name that we decided we, we didn't want to talk about it anymore. We just have a a backwards compatibility strategy and try to be really you know careful when we make changes uh, if there will ever be a 2.0 like it's not for this reason <laughs> because otherwise like this np uh, dot array is sort of like another library right in some sense yep exactly so yeah so that, that's you know that's one reason why there's this like you know retrieve and namespace thing so what we can do is we can take a regular NumPy array, and when you retrieve the namespace from it, you don't retrieve the regular main namespace, you return this special namespace with a new behavior. Right? So this won't break anybody's current code, right? but it's something you have to opt into because you, you, know, you, you write this line of code, give me a new API. All right. Um, all right. Don't don't look at the detail of this, but I wanted to say like a couple of words about the LPAC because it's it is a very interesting and, and important I think protocol. So really, what's happening there is um, this diagram is basically just a picture of the metadata that the LPAC basically sends it to the other library that calls it, and what's in the metadata is basically a description of memory layout. Uh, so there's a pointer to the data. Uh, and there's some attributes like the number of dimensions, uh, the shape, the strides, uh, the d-type. Um, but really, from a user perspective, all you need to know is this one line. You know, you type from the LPAC. And then under the hood, like this from the LPAC, we'll call the bottom, the bottom thing here, the def dunder the LPAC. I actually don't know if you see it, if I highlight my, my screen or not. <laughs> um, yeah, we can see. So it will, it will call that. So, so if the from the LPAC gets any arbitrary object that it doesn't know what it is, but it will just check, does it have this dunder the LPAC method? And I think you're starting to see a pattern here, right? Everything works by these dunder protocols. Um, then the, the, the object will basically give back the, you know, a capsule, which is basically just an opaque object that has the 
description of memory that's in this picture in it. And then the from the pack will basically do just check like, hey, what device is this data on? Do I even support that device? If not, like let's just raise an error. Um, then if it does, then if it's a GPU, it's going to handle the streams. If it's not GPU, like that step can be skipped. Um, and then it's going to uh, return like a, an, ar an array of its of its own kind, right? So if this is numpy dot from the L pack and X is like Jax, right? Jax will send its memory description and X my lib is then a numpy array, right? And then they will they will actually share the same memory, so it's a zero copy protocol. And right now, the majority of libraries already support this, and there's a couple. And a couple of important libraries that, that actually rely on this quite heavily. Uh, Spacey is probably the, the best example. The Spacey, I think, works with KuPy and it works with PyTorch. And then it has its own like internal algorithms and, and data structures as well. And all these three talk to each other via the LPAC. And so this seems to work really well. And we kind of now want to extend that so basically all libraries can you know, talk to each other that way. Cool. All right, so maybe a few words about where we are today. Um, we are, I wouldn't say we're, we're done, but the Array API standard is more than 95% complete. So I think we're probably not going to add any more functions. Maybe there's a few discussions ongoing where, you know, it, it's too hard to implement a certain function for backwards compatibility reasons. So we might rename it, but I don't think we're going to add any ones anymore. Uh, so there's only a couple of important discussion points left. Uh, one is about unique. Unique is a very weird function because it has three, like a, the unique functions, it just says like, hey, give me back the, uh, the unique values in my array. Uh, but it has three keywords that like return index return, I forgot, like three returns. And basically, so there's eight ways in which you can call it. And each of these return like triggers another return value. So it's a, it's a it's called a polymorphic function. It basically means like even the, the complete type of the output may change from an array to a tuple of arrays based on some keyword. And that's pretty hard to support for, uh, you know, for some libraries. So we may have to do something about that because it was it was harder than we initially expected. Um, and then there's some there's some type production promotion rules, in particular for reductions that we kind of they seem to have really special rules and all the libraries implement them and no one has documented them. So we only just figured it out. Uh, so we're gonna have to document what the rules actually are. And then the third one is people are now busy just implementing this, in particular in, in NumPy, uh, as well as in PyTorch and, and in KuPy. So that turns up lots of little issues or things that are maybe underspecified. Uh, and we just have to resolve those as they come up. Uh, but basically, mostly it's, it's switching to like, how do we actually roll this out now? Uh, so for NumPy, there's a, a NumPy enhancement proposal. Um, and that has been merged now. It's not final yet, because it only will be final when the implementation is complete too. But it has been merged. And there's a reference implementation that is pretty much complete. And the, the NumPy team has just said, like, uh, hey, let's merge this. Let's give it experimental status, because we have about six months till the next release. Um, but so. If everything goes well, this should be in the 1.22 release that's coming in December. Then for PyTorch, um, I actually just took a screenshot here. It's from a couple of months ago, uh, but it was decided maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago um, that their main target for compatibility is now gonna be this array API rather than NumPy. And the reason really is like, they're very close anyway. And the reason where the 
the, the, the places where the array API standard deviates from NumPy is usually for reasons like, hey, NumPy does something that's not good for GPUs. So in almost all those cases, PyTorch would prefer to be compatible with the array API standard. Uh, then Jax and Kupai, they haven't decided anything yet, but basically their, their general policy for anything is if NumPy has it, we, you know, we do it the same way, unless there's a very good reason not to. So they're basically just waiting till NumPy has the implementation and then they can add it in the same way because they want to make sure to remain compatible. And then Amexnet and Onyx have also said that they will implement it. Um, I think the, the actual work isn't that far along yet. And TensorFlow is likely to add support in, they have a tf.experimental namespace, um, which also has tf.experimental.numpy. So it's not that clear if they're like going to add a new one or they're going to switch the existing numpy one, um, but that's likely where it will land. Um, so overall, there, there's pretty good momentum, but there's, there's still a lot to do as well. Um, and then what's next since like, you know, first, first version seems relatively complete, but there's, there's a lot of other interesting things to do. Um, first, we have a, a library independent test suite that is actually right now being exercised on these PyTorch and, and NumPy implementations, which finds a lot of little issues. Uh, but it's, an, it's a nice test suite to have because you can just say, you know, set one environment variable or a config file and say, run this on my library, and it will tell you exactly all the places where it's not compatible. Um, and that we've done. What I didn't put here is that we would like to have the same for a benchmark suite. So we can do it with a test suite, we can do it with a benchmark suite. It's basically the same code. You know, it just has timing around it. And that would actually be really a nice way to compare the performance of all of these libraries. Because right now I think there's, you know, there's a ton of blog posts and you know other materials you can find of one-off comparisons, but they're they're really not very systematic. So it would be a very nice thing to have. Um, then there's a yeah, merge, there's a, I mean, the NumPy one, since it's a new namespace, it's also really going to be a reference implementation. Like it, it only ex implements exactly what's in the, in the standard and nothing more, right? So the main namespace will still have like 500 other functions, uh, but that, that one will really be scoped very tightly, which makes it a nice reference. So you can, sh you can be sure if it like, if you run against that implementation, and, it's, and your code works, you're not using anything that's not in the standard, right? So it's very likely going to work with, with Kupai or any other library as well. And then of course, the, let's say the, the proof is in the pudding. Like once we have these, these things, we're going to have to use them higher up in the stack. And in particular libraries like SciPy, scikit-learn, scikit-image. Um, you know, for me as a, as a SciPy maintainer, like it's particularly interesting because what I'm seeing is that like everybody has is kind of done with copying NumPy and like is now moving on to copying SciPy, right? So if you look at at uh, PyTorch, it now has a special namespace which is compatible with SciPy.special, and Jax has a Jax.SciPy.special Linux interpolate. So really like in an ad hoc fashion, like whenever some dev needs something, they, they kind of just steal the SciPy function in a signature and they just re-implement it. And I think that's that's not very sustainable. So I'd really like to see, you know, for SciPy kind of add this functionality so we can stop duplicating SciPy. Um, and then basically, if that all works out well, then you know we just need a little piece of paper where everyone says like, okay, I'm maybe not completely done yet, but this works for my library and I'm happy. And at some point we're just gonna give it a version number and say like, hey, this is the, this is the 2021 standard. And then we can think for anything new, we can think about a next version. And 
taking a step back to more than just the race, like this is roughly the roadmap for the year. Um, so we have some extension modules as well. Uh, like FFTs are not in right now, but basically that's a good extension module. Um, like it's something that it's not necessary. If you have an array library, it shouldn't be necessary to implement FFTs. They kind of like for scientific computing, they're very important, but for other domains, they may not be. Right, so say that's a that's an extension module, which means it comes in a separate namespace uh, with a given name, but other than that, has the same approach. So if you have this namespace, you should have these functions with these names and this behavior. Um, and then in the next version of the standard, I think the main addition is complex D types, because right now they weren't in because there are several libraries that don't have good support for complex D types yet. And I think PyTorch really is going to be stable only in 1.9, which isn't out yet. And then MaxNet really doesn't have anything yet. And then for data frames, we're going to do, like I talked a little bit about the LPAC. We really want something similar for data frames. And there, like nothing like that exists. And it's actually more complex. Um, so that's a, that's a whole effort in itself. Because for, you know, for arrays, it's still like, it's one block of memory typically that you can describe with one, you know, with a limited set of metadata. When you talk about a data frame, it can be like many blocks of memory that have different D types. And yeah, you know, it's it's a you know, it's a kind of more like a whole hierarchical structure. Um, so we're gonna look at that interchange protocol. And that that's in development right now. Uh, hopefully not within the next few weeks, at least to the point where we can publish it. And then go on and look at, you know, growing a, well, it says developer focused API there. It's a little bit different between arrays because there, there's no really a difference for arrays between developers and end users, right? It's kind of this flexible boundary where you're a maybe developer of some package, but you're also an end user if you do your science or data analysis. For data frames, it's a little bit different because there's a lot more well, let's call it magic involved. So really end users want as much magic as possible, while developers that write a, let's say you write a new library that depends on like Pandas or Vax or QDF or something like that, but you really want more control and you want predictability, right? It's in order to not have to deal with lots of bugs later. So we came to the conclusion that, that it, that's not necessarily, you can't necessarily have a good API for both developers and end users. So, and doing, doing an end user API without a good developer API seems like the wrong way around. So we focused on, on a developer API. And then the, the third bit is really about the, more like the organizational structure. Uh, like so far we've had about 20 people involved. Um, but really, there you know we have to make the governance a little bit more mature. And when when kind of projects want to like send new representation, uh, kind of figure out like how they can have a voice in the next version of the standard. So yeah, that that should keep us busy for the rest of this year. Then, well, how people can help the the. A very important one, I think, is just if this is interesting, uh, just have a look at it um, and give some feedback, especially if you have uh, use cases that are that are not covered. Uh, because designing for, for use cases is very important. And, and we tried to go out and, and find a lot of people that we knew had special cases, and had like deep learning community and a scientific computing community and compiler developers like a TVM or a Numba, like they, they look at the world very different way, but there may be still use cases that we missed. Um, and then there's also, there's always opportunities to contribute. Uh, like we haven't touched the benchmarking suite, for example. So if you're interested in performance, that'd be great. And then if you are, you know, if you have a package or you're a maintainer of some package or you're developing something new, uh, I think it's starting to get to the point where this should become useful to you. It's not useful for end users yet, because really 
it should land in a released version of an, of an NumPy and, and, or another library, then it becomes useful. Uh, but I think for package authors, uh, it might start to become useful already. Um, and then, yeah, if, if anyone wants to wants to talk about this, uh, it would also be great. Uh, or, you know, even has time to contribute uh, engineering time, even better. If you're interested in data frames, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Cool, so here's some resources. Um, I'm not gonna go through them. Um, this is what I wanted to share with you today. So yeah, thanks for listening. And yeah, if there are any more questions, please shoot. Thanks a lot, Rolf. Um, yeah, so let's see if someone who, who remained, because it's a bit early, uh, late, I would say, in our time zone. Well, in front rates, it's like in the same as in US 8.30. But anyway, yeah, so if we have questions, so please ask if there is a good opportunity to talk about this things. If not, I have a question also, like, uh, can we see from the, probably to talk about a bit more about from the user perspective. So what kind of like, what it opens like for here, here actually, I mean, in like our community in tools of the science, mostly like practitioners that just take libraries that don't maintain them. They just use them in like their use cases. And so for example, here, it will be like, uh, like I imagine it just probably naively, like I take Dusk, I put like PyTorch there, I mix it with TensorFlow and it should work, right? It's some, something like that. Or what kind of use cases actually, like high level use cases you think about? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's two very different things that would that would help the user, end user, right? One is, is how do you, you know, you can mix libraries more, right? Like uh, in particular, like, People are a lot of people are working with the likes of like Jax, PyTorch, TensorFlow now, because well, not only if you do deep learning, but also they're higher performance, right? With 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 auto diff and with you know GPU support and with you know with much better parallelization capabilities. So migrating between them is becoming much easier. And like you don't have to, if you have complex code base now and you say like, hey, you know, why don't we do the next version in, in like another library, you don't have to spend months like comparing and finding the bugs right. because you translated it wrong. So, so that's one benefit. And the other indeed is it, it's going to fill big gaps in functionality. Like if you right now have, you know, let's say PyTorch based implement code, right? And you want to do, you want to, use that with sidebar functionality, that really isn't going to work today, right? You, you have to go back and, and change all your PyTorch things back to NumPy in order to make it work. And especially like the higher level things, like the, the higher level functionality and like scipy.stats or like scikit image and make that work out of the box in, in a library like PyTorch or Jax, where you can get higher performance and all the nice things that they offer. I think that's, that's going to be the other big benefit. Right. Yeah. And probably the question is like, if there is an issue with one of these, if you mix it in some of the way you post the issue. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's going to be fun. <laughs> Hopefully it will be clear. That's, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Typically you, you're going to, you're going to file the issue for the actual function that you're calling. So yeah. maybe a small price to pay. S'il y a des gens qui préfèrent poser leurs questions en français et qui sont intimidés d'intervenir en anglais, n'hésitez pas à poser en français et on fera la traduction. Uh, very interesting, very technical for me. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the data scientists that have just used the, the libraries like this and just expect uh, to work. <laughs> um, 
you made me laugh because I was also in research in astrophysics and one of the problems we had was make sh making sure that uh, when we up upgrade the, the, the libraries, it's, the code was still working. That was before discovering uh, virtual environments and everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a hard job. Yeah. <laughs> So the packaging is another story, right? <laughs> oh, there is. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce your name correctly. Sorry uh, in advance. Um, Sasquatch. Um, he says that he's a beginning. How can I contribute to this project at this stage? Um, that's a good question. So. Probably the, the best thing to do if you would like to contribute is kind of start with reading the, uh, the actual, like the, the narrative part of the specification where it tries to explain this and see what's not clear. I think that would be very valuable feedback. I think it, in terms of writing code, like working on benchmarks could be a nice contribution, which is relatively accessible, I would say. Um, but I think having having fresh eyes like that haven't seen this before, and so far we've mainly shown this at people who are already experienced maintainers, right? Which are the first audience, so it has to make sense to them. But if it's like if there's jargon or it's so technical that it doesn't make sense to you as a kind of someone looking at this for the first time, uh, that would also be valuable, very valuable feedback. Because one of the the main things we try to do is is write not only like a specification, but really the, you know, explain the design in such a way that it's clear why things work the way they work. So thanks for the question. Hi. Uh, I want to thank you for the for this great, great presentation. Uh, and I have a question. So it's, um, I would like to know if you have um, some process to come up with a design decision. Um, and uh, yeah, what are the main obstacles or, and uh, based advice to give to some young people who may face such uh, problems? Yeah, that's a great question. I like that. Thanks. Um, so the first thing is like you, you, you have to have a process and you have to write down that process. So what we did was we wrote, um, we, did, we did two different things. Like we wanted to have a lot of data to base the, the decisions on because uh, we have our own gut feel, but really like that's not how you get to a consistent design, the gut feel of 10 or 20 people, right? So we wrote scrapers to look at each project's Sphinx stocks. Um, and we published that. There's a repo called, you know, it's, it's on the, I'll just type it in the chat so you can find it. On GitHub, it's here, array-api-comparison. And it has a nice accessible, like it has the actual data and it just has a make file based approach. It just generates a website with a comparison for each function. Uh, so, we, we did things like scrape all the public documentation, take the, the intersection of it and figure out like which function names are present in all seven libraries that we used, right? And then uh, look at function, keyword, et cetera, and, and just collect statistics on that. Uh, and of course, it wasn't that easy because sometimes things don't have the same name. So then you have to go manually in and kind of remap them. We did that, which was fairly tedious, but that, that's all there now. Uh, and the second part is we actually did the dynamic like runtime inspection as well. It's like not just what is there, but what do people actually use? So we scraped a whole bunch of notebooks from uh, GitHub, for example, as well as we ran, we took the test suites of things like, uh, like AstroPy and NetworkX and SciPy and Pandas and kind of ran that all with dynamic analysis, just counting like which functions are used, but also like if they're used, which keywords are used. And 
if there's if the keyword's used, what type does the input argument have? So we have very detailed data on you know how often is something used and, and just making rankings and, and leaving things out that you know sometimes we still decide to, to put something in for consistency reasons. Right? Like if you look at the Python operator, like some will be very not often used, like a bit shift or something. Like that's a very specific low level thing. Like if there's 20 operators and 18 are often used and two are not, like okay, let's do the last two as well. So you have to apply some common sense, but starting from just the raw data, like what's you know, just ranked by what's used, what's not used, is very useful. So it's a data approach, right? Yeah. Database approach. Yeah. So the, yeah. Like start with data and then try to add some human intelligence on top. I had another question about like a parallelization, probably if we yeah. have a bit time. Well, that because I have one more thought. Like I personally have also been like inspired from the job I had previously in, in semiconductor engineering, where People who've worked on hardware, they have a they have a much different approach than software people. They really write specifications and data sheets and they do like, you know, requirements management, right? Like they write down like this this building block has to do A, B, and C, and it has to fit in so much space and you know, things like that, right? And software people don't do that. They just start writing code. So we tried to take a little bit of that former approach. And there's multiple names for it. Uh, you know, the things like requirements engineering or model driven design are probably things you can look up. And, and I find them very valuable to come to a, to a design that's actually useful and coherent. All right, I think do you want to say something about parallelism. Well, it was just actually, I, I really appreciate this, this comparison between hardware and software. That's true that well, specification is still something hard to write, probably for software guys, and well, but it's still valuable, right? Uh, my question was about this, uh, like parallelism, because, uh, like, well, the, probably the first level of usage, like, probably not NumPy, but PyTorch or TensorFlow, whatever. So we have a sort of single device and we have a sort of limitation of single device and then we uh, discover these distributed things and what are your thoughts on how to support these things yeah so i think it's a different problem that we on purpose didn't try to tackle because it's an it's an execution problem rather than a All right. than a what result to expect problem but there is a really interesting problem to solve there and i think it's not so much for pytorch or tensorflow because they're you know, they basically have such a large team that they just build everything, right? Like they have, they have parallelism on one node, they have, they have different way to get multi-node parallelism. But for other projects, it hasn't been like that, right? So NumPy basically is still single thread. So, and then to get parallelism on a single node, you can use multi-processing or you can use threading or you can use Dask. And then for a multi-node thing, you know, you probably want to ask, or you know, maybe there's a few people that want to try Ray now, but I think majority will want to use Dask. And you kind of have this kind of coordination problem where different levels of parallelism live in different libraries. And it gets even worse when you you, you use linear algebra and there you use something like MKL or OpenBAS, and they have open they use OpenMP under the hood. So they're gonna auto parallelize on a single node while the rest of NumPy does not. And then Dask is gonna do it, but it's, it's gonna do it explicitly, right? Or multi-processing. So in all these levels of parallelism, don't talk to each other. So there's no good solution, but I know it's a hard enough problem that it requires like a similar approach where multiple authors of different libraries have to like stick their hats together and kind of coordinate, otherwise it will never be solved. That's true. Well, for example, the second learn they or they use this job lib approach, right? So it's sort of one of the examples, right? So yeah, the API. Okay. It's actually like second learn APIs are really well designed, but it's still clearly a, like a suboptimal design where they have the you know they have this end jobs keyword, right? 
and it basically expects the user to say like how many cores to use. And, and SciPy has the same. We call it workers rather than end jobs, but it's basically the same. Um, the only reason is you can also actually give it a multiprocessing pool or an OpenMP pool rather than just, just an integer. So it's a little bit more general. Mm -hmm. But really, it's, a, it's kind of forced by the limitation that if you try to do everything automatic and then the library you're calling is also trying to do automatic, then you know, if you have n cores, you're going to at some point have, end up with n squared processes and everything is going to you know, go to hell. Makes sense, makes sense. Thanks. Looks like we're out of questions. Right. Well, yeah, so if there is no other <laughs> burning questions about how the things going. So, yeah, so uh, the, thanks a lot, Ralph, for, uh, uh, yeah, so, so some organized, well, it depends on, like, I, I know this also, yeah, you have the vaccine shot, previously, so probably it's up to you. If you'd like to join us there, so we can. Do it for sure. I had my vaccine shot four hours ago, so I still feel like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, well. Those who would like to join there. Uh, otherwise, yes. Yeah, so the presentation will will try to put it on the meetup, and we'll let everyone who participated. Well, th there is a YouTube um, video will be posted, and the presentation. If you'd like to share it with us, and we can then spread it in the meetup platform. Awesome. Well, thanks again for the invite and and for all the interesting questions. So, so, yeah, some, some, can you explain how it works with the things, please? That is, um, let me just.